This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support my channel and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Let me just show you that. On paper, Danielle and Kristen Sills are the perfect first time home buyers. They've upped their budget and widened their search of the Boston area, but the last house they bid on had 29 offers. It sold for about seventy or 80000 over what the asking price was. And it was a 1,200-square-foot home. Finding an affordable apartment was hard enough before the pandemic, right? But now things are even worse. Some are calling it a crisis. The shortage is now critical. Affordable so-called Class C apartments are 96% occupied nationally. When they go shopping, the inventory, the active listings they can choose from, are down about 30% from this time last year. That's just a staggering shortage of homes on the market right now. He compares this with what happened during the subprime mortgage crisis a decade ago. Millions of homeowners defaulted on their mortgages and investors came in to buy the properties and convert them into rental housing. So you're gonna see a lot more of this soon, Shep. As you watch this video, you're probably sitting somewhere with a roof over your head. For many of you, it's probably your home. Either that or you're watching at work. In which case, I applaud you for stealing back some of your extracted value. Shelter is one of the most critical needs of almost every species on Earth, including humans. It's integral to the American dream. A modest home with a white picket fence, two and a half kids, and so on. Homelessness is rightly seen as something society needs to address, as most decent people feel that no one should go without shelter in our modern era. And yet, despite the importance of housing and the significance we place on having somewhere to call home, it seems that the U.S. is on a collision course with another housing crisis. It may not take exactly the same form as the housing crash of the Great Recession, but it is coming, and it's not looking good. In this episode, we'll explore the state of housing in the U.S. and consider what factors are feeding this growing problem. Before we get into the causes of this looming housing crisis, let's take a look at a few statistics. If you look at the housing market today, you'll notice a few things. First, there aren't many single-family houses to be had. People just aren't selling. The houses that do go up for sale are snapped up incredibly quickly, typically within a week or even a couple of days. Having to offer tens of thousands of dollars over the listing price has become the norm if you want to actually have a chance of having the winning bid. If you owned a home and you put it up for sale today, odds are you'd have at least a handful of offers by the end of the day, and many of them would be well over the asking price. Month-over-month -month price increases are now exceeding even the absurd levels we saw in 2006. And we all know what happened shortly after that. What's going on here? A big part of the problem is that the housing market is incredibly short on supply. Pace of housing production has slowed dramatically, contributing to an already serious lack of housing. This is partly due to a shortage of construction materials, and partly just a continuation of the trend of producing fewer and fewer homes per year. As of 2021, the U.S. faces a shortage of roughly 7 million homes. That's a lot of demand. But a housing shortage isn't the only problem here. The big picture is this. Young people are trying to buy affordable homes, but the prices for even the most modest quote starter homes are out of reach. These prices have been driven up by institutional money pouring into the housing market to snatch up homes as investment properties, including the homes of those recently evicted during the pandemic. To make matters worse, some large investment firms are lobbying to end eviction protections so that they can acquire even more houses, adding to the housing demand and homelessness problems at the same time. With single-family homes out of reach for the average working American, the media has begun trying to frame perpetual renting as a good thing, something that benefits young people. The problem there is that even renting is becoming prohibitively expensive. There are now officially zero counties in the entire country where a worker earning the federal minimum wage can afford a one-bedroom apartment. Even for those making significantly more than minimum wage, things are looking pretty grim. There's a common joke that goes something like, the bank said I couldn't afford an $1,800 a month mortgage, so now I pay $3,000 a month in rent. The cherry on top is the true unemployment rate. If we take the LICEP definition for unemployment, someone who is looking for a full-time job that pays a living wage but cannot find one, then the true rate of unemployment in the U.S. currently sits at a staggering 23.7%. So even if, quote, affordable housing were available, it likely wouldn't be affordable because nearly a full quarter of Americans can't find a job that pays a living wage. With that context out of the way, let's look at how these problems combine to form the perfect storm for economic meltdown. We'll start with everyone's favorite bad guys, the billionaires. 
It should come as no surprise that the people putting in bids at 60, 80, 100 thousand dollars over asking price are not your average person. They're typically the ultra wealthy, usually through investment firms or other real estate poaching groups. Let's take Charles Koch as an example. One of the billionaire Koch brothers, Charles has donated millions of dollars to three conservative organizations spearheading the push to eliminate COVID eviction protections. This alone would be reprehensible. But since the beginning of the pandemic, he's also been heavily investing in real estate, snatching up homes left and right to add to his massive portfolio of assets, among them the homes of the evicted and desperate. In April 2020, he dumped $200 million into Amherst Holdings, a company which brags it has acquired over 30,000 homes since 2012. Coke Real Estate Investments was also among the investment groups that recently bought an ownership stake in SmartRent, a landlord technology company. Charles Koch is not alone in this scheme. Billionaires, investment firms, and giant corporations are buying up as many homes as they possibly can, which is driving prices way beyond the reach of the average American. And they're also betting big on the lucrative future of the rental market. It should be clear that very few normal people are going to be able to afford to make offers on homes that exceed the asking price by tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. But some media outlets would have you believe that giant real estate firms aren't the bad guys here. For example, Vox put out an article saying things like, everybody wants to blame BlackRock, and Wall Street isn't to blame for the chaotic housing market. To give them the benefit of the doubt, yes, obviously everything has multiple variables which influence material reality. But it's a little on the nose to say BlackRock is good actually, when the CEO of Vox Investor General Atlantic is on the board of directors at BlackRock. And even if that weren't the case, the Vox article makes some strange assertions, claiming for example that institutional investors just aren't that interested in single-family homes. This is demonstrably false, as firms like BlackRock have bought up hundreds of thousands of single-family homes since the Great Recession, and they continue to hold them hostage on the rental market. Then there's Airbnb. If you go on vacation, odds are you'll find dozens of cute, freshly renovated two-bedroom units to choose from entire neighborhoods empty except for out-of-state license plates. There's no such thing as an affordable home anymore. They've all been bought up, whether by institutional investors or wannabe real estate moguls, and turned into Airbnbs or rentals, and very few new ones are being built. In fact, there's a new trend of building suburban neighborhoods not with the intention of selling the homes, but of selling the entire development to investment firms who then rent out the houses. Vox isn't the only instance of media trying to manufacture consent for endless renting. The Wall Street Journal says it's generational preferences that are pushing young people to rent instead of buying a home. But it's not preference at all. Most young people would love to have the stability of owning a home, especially when mortgages are now typically much lower than rent prices in the same area. But they've been priced out of home ownership, and now it's looking like they're going to be priced out of renting too. Companies that have a stake in people renting are pushing for an end to home ownership. Bloomberg says things like, Rising real estate prices are stoking fears that home ownership, long considered a core component of the American dream, is slipping out of reach for low and moderate income Americans. That may be so, but a nation of renters is not something to fear. In fact, it's the opposite. They end their article with, this country was always more about new frontiers than comfortable settlements anyway. Which translates as, you will suffer and never be able to afford a home and that's good because it's the American way. So, we have entire generations of Americans no longer being able to afford single family homes. We have rapidly increasing rent prices to the point where an eviction crisis is very likely. Large corporations are buying up all the available housing and actively trying to get more people evicted so they can snatch up their homes too. New communities are being developed not to be used for affordable housing, but explicitly for the purpose of making a new suburban renter class that is held hostage by landlords and faceless investment firms. And the media is telling us that actually this is what we want, and that stability and building equity is bad. This all adds up to one serious economic crisis looming on the horizon. It's always hard to predict exactly what form the fallout will take, but it's usually a safe assumption that the brunt of the suffering will fall upon those who have little say in the matter. Lower income people who are just trying to get by. The major players who are manipulating the market and causing these problems will suffer no consequences. And if the Great Recession is anything to go by, they will actually dramatically increase their wealth at the expense of the rest of the population. Well, this all sounds pretty bad. What's the solution here? 
How can we avoid another massive economic collapse? Historically speaking, we can't. Capitalism is built on the maintenance of cycles of boom and bust, and they're fairly predictable in their timing. These crises are becoming more frequent and more damaging to the average person, but also more lucrative for the ruling class. And if we know anything about capitalism, it's that when the ruling class is benefiting from something, it will not change without a massive, drawn-out struggle. If you're a young person, or a person of any age really, if you're looking for a home, I don't think it would be wise to try to buy one now. I know it's easy to say, save more money, but do what you can to squirrel away a few bucks here and there. Rent will continue to go up, but the chaos surrounding single-family homes can't last forever. It's unsustainable even in the fairly short term. I think a crash of some sort is likely, and hopefully, if we can ride out the storm, housing prices might come down somewhat afterwards. The giant real estate firms will have added many new properties to their portfolio, but it's very unlikely that they will have bought them all. Once supply chains recover from the pandemic, construction materials become more available, and the home buying frenzy dies down a little bit, hopefully there will be some homes available for first-time buyers. In the meantime, we have some actions we need to take. First, we need to push back against the media talking points about generational preferences and the benefits of renting. They support a predatory, exploitative status quo that we should not accept. If they want us to rent, we need to demand affordable apartment housing with rates that only increase with inflation, not at the whims of parasitic landlords. We also need to remember that, once upon a time, owning a home was within reach for just about every American. Back in the 50s, a suburban home only cost two or three times the average salary, which meant that not only could people easily afford them, they could pay them off in a matter of a few years rather than over the course of three decades. Like almost everything else under modern capitalism, housing has shifted from being seen as a basic necessity to a valuable commodity from which the wealthy can extract massive profits. The best thing we can do right now is continue to fight evictions, organize tenants unions to build bargaining power against the landlords, fight for higher wages across the country, and support our neighbors however we can. You are an individual, but you're also a member of one of two classes, either the working class or the capitalist class. If you do not own the means by which capital is produced, a factory, an office building, a block of apartments, a large company, you are a member of the working class. And that means your fight is the same as the people at risk of eviction, or who make $7.25 an hour, or who can't afford their medical bills. Only by acting in solidarity with your class can you make a significant impact. If you do own the means of production, if you have wealth at your disposal, we need you too. We wouldn't have had Marx without Engels. Donate to mutual aid funds, buy and distribute copies of socialist books, use your free time to help in whatever ways you can. Everyone has a role to play. And in the housing crisis or any other fight, organizing is key to victory. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this kind of content, while very important, is something that sponsors won't touch. In order to pay the bills and keep this channel running, I rely on AdSense revenue, sponsors, and donations from generous viewers. By producing explicitly anti-capitalist content, I lose out on both sponsors and AdSense. If you enjoy the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. You can find my Patreon page, join our growing Discord server, and get early access to every episode at patreon.com slash second thought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous episodes by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.